Josh. Josh Jr., you know, as opposed to old man Josh over here with the beard, you know, that I call him old man Josh, you know, anyway. Josh is going up to get my remote that I forgot because I left it on the charging plug upstairs <laughs> for the for to advance the slides for the message this morning. So, you know, I'm getting old, I'm getting forgetful, I forgot things anyway, so that he's he's doing that for me. It's plugged into the backup <laughs> on the thing. Uh, anyway, this morning, uh, Curtis was talking earlier about the thing about ABBA. On the 23rd, the program director for ABBA is going to come visit with us for about 10, 15 minutes to talk about what ABBA does to help out people who are in crisis. Okay, you know, ladies, women who are in crisis. There's, there's a lot of challenging situations in life. And they are doing a wonderful job helping people advancing the kingdom of God, actually being salt of the earth. They are doing a great job. But in the process of doing that, one of the things we could do, a simple thing that we could do to help out, is this idea that they have a resale store. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, a resale store, that, that's part of how they raise money to fund the things that they do. So if you have useful things, not, not junk that needs to go in the dumpster, or, you know what I mean? If you've got things at home that you want to get rid of that they could uh, sell you know, uh, in the resale store, clothing or items, household items and things that would be useful, that's one way to impact the world because they use that money to impact the world. You know, they have sometimes opportunities to share the gospel with people. Uh, last time Tawny was up there with... Uh, she does sonograms up, up there um, when they do sonograms for women. And, you know, and so she was up there, and there was this one young woman that obviously had had some challenges in life, and she was there. She was in tears. Tawny uh, sat with her and prayed with her and talked for, with her for a good while. But they also have counselors. They have people who teach life skills and things like that. It's, it's a good program. But bringing that stuff here... Uh, to the church, if you would like to do that, you can take it directly to ABBA, but if you bring it here, we'll load it up, we'll take it up to, uh, to ABBA for their resale store. But they also need new things, baby wipes, diapers, you know, it's in the bulletin, you can see the sizes that they particularly need. You know, monetary gifts are always good, but these are things that impact the world. So if you want to be part of that, please feel free to do that. Let the Spirit guide you on how you can impact the world doing that. But we're going to talk about salt today. This is about salt and light living, but we're going to talk about salt today. And, you know, there's all kinds of different salt. So, you know, you know, when I was going to do this, I thought, well, okay, I need to bring salt up here to have something to, to talk about and point at. And so I started looking around, what kind of salt do we have in our house? You know, we, we have pickling salt, you know, that if you look on the ingredient list, it just says ingredients, salt. Okay, well, what kind of salt? Well, it's sodium chloride type salt. And then you have sea salt, and the ingredients say sea salt. Okay, so you take seawater, you, 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 you know, dry it out, you get salt, plus a bunch of other junk, so they have to clean the other gunk out, you know, and things like that. So you get sea salt, and then, oh, fancy culinary pink Himalayan sea salt, you know, from the mountains, you know, so they're digging it out of mines in the mountains and stuff, but it's ancient sea salt. There's all kinds of salts. If you go to the store, you can buy salts from Celtic ocean water. You can buy some Mediterranean salt. You can get all kinds of salt. Okay. You know, so what's the purpose of salt? You know, they got these big giant salt mines. They, they store nuclear waste in the salt mines, you know, and all kinds of things. You know, you'd salt use for everything. So why do we use salt? Salt is a preservative, right? It's also to give taste, and it's also to purify. In our modern world, we don't always think about that. Salt is cheap. Salt's inexpensive, you know, relatively, unless you're going to get finely granulated culinary pink Himalayan sea salt then it's kind of pricey. But the issue is, it's, it's still, in relative terms, salt is inexpensive. You know, I want you to put your minds back into the ancient world a little bit. Salt was expensive, okay? It took a lot to, to evaporate salt water to get salt that was usable, 
okay? Or to dig it out of a mine. That was a lot of work and it was dangerous. Salt was expensive. The ancient Chinese actually made money out of salt wafers. You know, they used uh, coins made of salt. And sometimes in the European world, they would trade salt ounce for ounce for gold. It was worth its weight in gold in some parts of Europe and stuff. Salt was expensive. And when Jesus was talking to the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the salt of the earth. What in the world is he talking about? In their world, salt is essential for preservation. They didn't have refrigeration and everything. They used salt to preserve stuff. They used salt to purify things. They would rub it on newborn babies to, to, for purification, for cleaning and stuff. Salt was essential for offering sacrifice in the temple with grain offerings. It had to be seasoned with salt. God commanded this. <clears throat> A covenant of salt was considered everlasting and unbreakable. God's covenant with King David was a, scripture says, was a covenant of salt. You can go look that up when you want. But the issue is it was considered unbreakable. And so salt was an essential thing. It was valuable. It was important. It was essential in the ancient world. Most of us today just think of it as, oh, it tastes good. You know, and then we eat too much of it in America, you know, and stuff, you know, and we overdo it. Because it's, it's, it's just a commodity. To them, it was essential and important. And so Jesus tells people that they are the salt of the earth. Okay, it's important to understand then that you as believers, we as believers are salty. We're salty, okay? We're the salt of the earth. We're salty. And, and this is important because... God sees you as valuable, each one of us. We are valuable in his sight because salt is valuable and is essential. So I want you to just say to yourself, I am salty, I'm salty. Because, you know, and I don't mean it in the old Navy way, you know, where, you know, some sea salt, you know, kind of salty old sailor, okay. Mm. Some salty old sailors are just kind of, yeah, well, old sea dogs, you know. <clears throat> Tony and I could tell you some stories. She's not here. I'm not going to get into that. The issue is, is that we're talking about what God says because the world has something different. The world says that, yeah, just normal people, ordinary people are the salt of the earth. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's a world corruption of what Jesus says. Jesus says his disciples are the salt of the earth. You know, if, if, for those of you all that have seen the movie Blazing Saddles, anybody seen that movie? Am I the only one that's ever seen that movie? Okay. All right. You remember in there with the character, Gene Wilder character, he's talking to the sheriff that came to town and the town rejected the sheriff because they're racist and they're prejudiced and blah, blah, blah. And he's talking to the sheriff and trying to make him feel better by saying, hey, you know, these people are just the salt of the earth and, you know, they don't understand. They're just a bunch of morons, right? Okay, that's what he says. <clears throat> the moron part was an ad lib that they that he added. It wasn't part of the script. They added it. They thought it worked well, and they kept it in the movie. You can go look that up if you want. But the deal is, is that Hollywood is taking what? This salt of the earth idea and corrupting it because their world isn't godly. Okay? So you, you have this thing. God sees you as valuable as the salt of the earth. Disciples are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. God sees us as essential and valuable. And why is that? It isn't just about its taste. That's an important thing. But salt preserves things. Salt purifies things. Salt heals things. Remember, we're thinking the frame of reference of the people of the day when Jesus is talking about. They see this as valuable and important and essential to life, okay, especially in the hot areas that they're in. You're going to be sweating that stuff out. They need this. But it has to have its powers, its things, the things that salt does. And just like it says in the scripture that's up on the screen, you know, you're the salt of the earth. But if it isn't salty, if it doesn't have that salt power, it's not good for anything. You know, it doesn't fertilize, it destroys the soil, soil and stuff like that. The Romans, when they defeated the Carthaginians, they sowed salt 
into the fields around Carthage so it couldn't be rebuilt to destroy the land so that their long-term enemies couldn't return. Okay, and this happened in other parts of the Mediterranean world. It was something that you know enemies did to destroy the others, you know, over time because salt can kill things too if it isn't used correctly. Okay, uh, on my grandfather's farm, there's there was this big area in one of the fields, one of the pastures, hay fields, that was barren. Nothing grew there. And I asked my dad, what was it? Well, they, they, they tried to put an oil well there once. This is before I was born. And they put an oil well there. The line broke, so ruptured or whatever, and salt water ended up spilling out all over the hay field. And there was this, it was probably, it was <clears throat> when I was out there working in the fields, baling hay and stuff, by the time I got to that age, it was probably down to an acre size. Okay, it was a large area that the salt water had just had ruined it, and it gradually got smaller and smaller as the salt, as the rain leached the salt out of the soil. But salt will do that. Oh, it kills things too. That's how it preserves, by the way, is because it's killing the germs. The ancients didn't understand germs; they didn't know about that. But they knew that food was preserved, and things did better. And so, this is important for us to understand that canning and pickling salt helps to preserve things. It's not just about, you know, making it taste better. You can buy Smithfield hams. They're just smoked and salted. They're not even refrigerated, you know? They're preserved. You better like salt because they taste really salty. <laughs> they're kind of dry too. But you can do that. So where am I going with all of this stuff? First of all, I want everybody to understand, God thinks you're valuable. God thinks you're essential to his plan because you're the salt of the earth. Salt is important. But let's see, how do we become salt of the earth? What does that mean? How do we actually do that in real life, in true life? Well, in Colossians it says, you need to walk with wisdom toward outsiders, that is, people who are not part of the kingdom of God, people who don't believe. You need to be walking in wisdom <clears throat> with them and make good use of your time with them. You talk to them reasonably. You don't lecture them. You don't yang, yam, yang. It's not this... You know, have you ever seen these people who stand at the street corner with a Bible in one hand and shake their fist at people as they're driving by? That doesn't advance the kingdom of God. It may think, that, you know, some of these people may think they're powerful, but it isn't working. Okay? It turns people off. That is not walking in wisdom toward outsiders. When you speak in love, that's something totally different. And that is letting your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you know how to answer each person. What does it mean to be seasoned with salt with your speech? Remember, salt is valuable. Salt purifies. So it's pure. It's holy. It's righteous. It's not just your opinions. It's based on the Word of God. And it preserves people. It builds people up. It strengthens and encourages people. It's not putting them down. It's seasoned with salt. So you know how to talk with people and encourage and build up. You know, but being the salt of the earth to do that, where you're encouraging and you're walking with wisdom toward outsiders, you know, that thing I was saying about Abba, where you can bring stuff and they can use it in the resale store to help advance what they're doing. You can volunteer time. You could do other things there. Or Visto, they do the same. They do, it's a different thing they're doing, but it's still impacting the world. It's still impacting the community. Or you can do it in a bunch of different ways, but the idea is you're the salt of the earth and you're impacting this by doing things. You're walking, I'm sorry, walking in wisdom with people outside the kingdom to bring them into the kingdom because the idea is we love people and we want them to experience the love of God. And so that's what it is to be the salt of the earth. But how do I do that? When I, as an individual, am working or talking or interacting with somebody else, the Word of God says, be imitators of Christ. That's a choice we can make. We choose to be an imitator of Christ. God doesn't force us to be like Him. 
We can choose to follow Jesus and be like Him. The Holy Spirit will change us from the inside. But we have to allow that to happen. God's not going to force us to become like Jesus. We walk in love because Christ loved us first. Remember, God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, right? That whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life, right? God loved us even when we were all doofed up. And so when we imitate Jesus, we're loving other people even when they are all doofed up. They're still all messed up, right? You don't become perfect instantly when you become a believer. It takes some time. And certainly when you're not a believer, you're going to have all kinds of issues, right? You're going to have all kinds of problems. It's like the lady that, or young lady, girl, teenager, whatever that Tawny was counseling with and the others are counseling with at Ava. You know, she's obviously had a tough life, hard life, right? But, you know, between the, the tattoos and the, you know, the weird hair and the this and the that, you know, and I mean, you know, you know, drug use or whatever else, you know, the issue is, is it's been tough. But you walk in love, care for people, build them up. Because that's what God did for each one of us. He lifted us up out of the dirt. Okay, you know, I, you know, I've talked to him in here before about the, 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 the video series, The Chosen. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It is, it's edgy. It's not some touchy-feely, everybody is just so perfect kind of show. But I tell you, it is spot on in terms of what God is trying to get across to people. And it's well done. Because when Jesus shows up in the bar to take, speak to Mary Magdalene, it's real. That doesn't mean that there's anything in Scripture or anything that says that's the way it happened. But that's real life stuff. Okay? I want everybody to get it. That God loved us even when we were in the pit. Okay? And so that's what God's calling us to do is to be salt in the world and touch people. But he says, yeah, stay away from sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. Because that's not proper among the saints. Why? Salt purifies. And that doesn't mean that we're perfect. Because some of us, you know, we fail on a regular basis. But guess what? God is a God of second chances. Because how many people in here would, didn't need, ever need a second chance? Anybody ever not need a second chance? I, I think everybody in here has need a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever chance. All right? Oh, I certainly have. <laughs> you know, pretty frequently, as a matter of fact, need another chance. You know, got to use scientific notation to count the number of times that you know, needed another chance. <laughs> anyway, if you don't know what that means, that's okay. It's fine. You know, it probably means you're better off in life. Anyway, the <laughs> so you know, but the the issue is, is that you know, also. He doesn't want us talking with just gunk stuff, right? Our words need to be lifting up and thanksgiving and praise and, and good stuff because those things are out of place, especially when we're talking with people who are outside the kingdom. We want them to be inside the kingdom, okay? I mentioned the thing a while ago about the salty sailor stuff and all that kind of things. You know, yeah, naval aviation can be kind of a, a raunchy place at times, you know. I mean, you know, out there on the carrier, there weren't any women on board ship when I was there, okay? You know, so it could be, you know, they had rules and regulations about things, but things got, you know, they could be a little raunchy, especially when you pull into port in the Philippines and stuff like that. And it's, it's pretty wild life, okay? But, you know, I don't, know. I don't need to go any further. Those of y'all who know what I mean, you know what I mean. The issue is, is that, you know, and so I'm, you know, with these guys, and I'm with them. They know where I stand on things. They know where it is. But, you know, you're salt of the earth. You're hanging with them, doing things, not doing immoral things, but you're establishing relationship 
And so we had this one group, you know, pilots, and we'd be deployed in Puerto Rico, and you're there, and you got this stuff, and that's where pina coladas were invented, right? Yeah, pina colada. And, you know, you can sing the colada song, you know, all that stuff. There's a plaque on the wall in San Juan, Puerto Rico, where it says, this is where the pina colada was invented, at this building, and this date. You know, there's a big bronze plaque on the wall. Like, you know, it's a historical thing, marker. And so the deal is, is that, you know, we'd be out there. We had this blender we took with us, and, you know, they'd make pina coladas. And so what they would do is they'd make the, all the stuff. They'd pour one out for me, and then they'd pour, the, they'd take a glass full of rum and pour it in there and mix it up. So they gave me a, a pina colada without the rum in it, and then they did the thing. Okay. You know, and... You know, and when we're, you know, you come back in, you can bring a certain number of bottles of rum back, duty-free and stuff like that, you know, from, you know, St. Thomas and stuff back. To say. So I'd bring a couple of bottles of rum back with me for the other guys, you know. The issue is, is that you got to have some relationship if you want to have people coming into the kingdom. It doesn't mean you have to live their lifestyle, but you got to have a relationship with them. Jesus ate with sinners, Right? And tax collectors. And people hated that in his day. But he was impacting them for the kingdom. Now, now there's people who think, well, I can go do whatever I want and live. With, you know, okay. Jesus didn't engage in their lifestyle. Right? He ate with them, spent time with them, tried to bring them to the kingdom. He didn't do the things, the immorality that they were doing. You see the difference when Jesus was with him? That he wasn't collecting taxes, and a hated tax collector. He, he wasn't living in prostitution when he's eating with prostitutes and, and fellowshipping with them. You see the difference? Okay, but he was loving them and caring for them and interacting and talking with them and eating with them, which drove the religious people of his day nuts, just like it would re, you know, drive the religious people in Christianity nuts today, because who, oh, how dare you go into that place, and how dare you talk to that person? That's, Jesus is who we need to follow and be like, and he did those things, okay? This is how you're salt of the earth. Okay, another thing you can do to be salt of the earth Besides the stuff, you know, with Ab and Visto and things, those are good things. Those are important things because you're impacting the world when you help do that. Whether it's you give money or you bring baby things or you bring household items they can resell and stuff, that's impacting the world. But another way you can do that is to get engaged with the political process. Okay. I mean, Christians are like, oh, that's dirty and that's nasty. Politics are bad. Now, I'm not going to say, well, I'll be contaminated by the politicians. You know, that's, that's, that's Pharisee talk, okay? The issue is, is be like Jesus and go get engaged with those tax collector politicians. And I know some of y'all have been politicians, so don't take it the wrong way. Don't get you know, upset when I say that. The issue is, is what I'm trying to say is go get engaged, Make a difference in your world. There was a thing on the news not too long ago. One of the school districts in the Metroplex area, this is, so this is reasonably local, and they're, it's on the news. They're showing video, the school board thing, and parents are there. They're all upset, rightly so. But the important thing is, is that the parents are engaged finally in school board activities. Okay, But the parents are engaged in this school discussion. And this is all about people electing to use different restrooms and stuff like that. The boys can go to the girls' restroom and vice versa, and, you know, and all these craziness stuff. You know, the social engineering coming out of Washington, D.C. is about trying to destroy this country with its immorality and stuff out of Washington, D.C. And, you know, so the school board's kind of caught in the middle. You got parents telling them one thing. You got Washington, D.C. saying, we got the money you know, that we give out and stuff we want it our way, right? And so they're kind of stuck with this stuff, all these rules and stuff coming out of the Department of Education and everything. And so we got to stand against that. The church has got to stand against that. The early church did things like that. You need to understand, the early church stood against abortion, which was common in the Roman world in the first century. Lots of women died from it, but it was a common thing. Okay, babies were abandoned in the streets. If you want, hey, hey, you want a baby, hey, it's laying out in the street. You pick it up, take it home, turn it into a slave. That's the way the Roman world was. 
Or you need some kid you want to adopt? Yeah, it's out there. You know, they just leave them out in the street to die. You know, that's, that's the way Rome was. Christians stood against that. Christians stood for life. Christians in the early church did what God called them to do. And Christians need to do that today and not be corrupted by the world system who tells you, oh, it needs to be this way. No, it doesn't. We live the way God wants it. So in this school board thing that I was just talking about, parents are engaged. They're happy. There's 40,000 students in that school district. And so, and they're uptight about this thing about sharing restrooms and stuff. Well, you know why it gets like that? Because the teachers and administrators go to colleges where they do that. That's been changed years ago in college level. And so now they got this mentality, it's the way it should be in high schools. And that way it should be in grade schools. And that's the way it should be all, you know, oh, you have common bathrooms at home, don't you? <laughs> Stupid stuff, arguments. The issue is, is that where Parker went to school, they started converting their rest, you know, the, the bathrooms and shower things to be co-ed, you know, years ago. People, parents show up and that used to go to school there and they're like, you've done what? The school is like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. This is good. You know, so you got, let's think about it, 18 to 24 year old young adults, <laughs> you know, you know, taking showers next to each other, you know, using the same restrooms all the time, you know, and you, yeah, I think there isn't anything going on back after you get back to your room. The issue is, is that that kind of stuff has been pushed by politicians for a while. I have a point why I'm tying this back to the school district thing. There's been pushing it. But when you go and you hear what was going on in that school district, the Metroplex, this is all on the news, you know, you can go watch it. You know, you go find the old videos. You know, this is only a few days ago. And so you got 40,000 students and school board people or school administrators are like answering questions. It's like, well, how many people are doing this transgender bathroom thing? Seven have applied to do that. You got 40,000 students and seven want to do this. So we're wagging the whole dog with the tip of the tail out of Washington, D.C. that you got to go do this for seven students that have applied to do this. You got more high schools in the district than that. But you got to make accommodation for all of this stuff. The world is doofed up because for years the church is set on its thumbs in church buildings thinking, oh, politics is dirty. I don't want to get involved. I'm encouraging us to be the salt of the earth, like Jesus said, to purify, to clean, to season, and to stand up for righteousness. Okay? Get involved with the political system one way or another and do it on God's side. Pray, God, who do you want me to vote for that's going to stand up for righteousness? And actually do it, not just talk about it. Actually do something. Okay? And do like me. You can write a check. You know, send it to your representative. Oh, well, they just use it for blah, blah. I don't care. You're voting with your check by encouraging an activity. If you send it to a politician who is standing up for godliness and righteousness in the marketplace, okay? When you go in and cast your vote for somebody who stands up for godliness and righteousness in the marketplace, okay? So, you know, and I know that that might aggravate some people, and you know, da, 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 da. too bad. You know, the church of Jesus followers, especially from early times, challenged the world system. Okay, what is right and what is wrong? Challenge it to do what's right. Okay, and not hide in the cocoon of the church building. But that's what the poly, that's that's what the social engineering people have been trying to tell the church forever. You can do all that church stuff. Just do it in your building. Don't contain, You know, don't try and tell us what to do in the world. You just do your thing, and you'll be okay. And we'll let you go. You know, no. Don't, don't put up with that. It's kind of like the thing with COVID-19. 
you know, and said, oh, we got to shut down the churches because it'll spread disease. But we can keep the movie stuff open where they're, you know, we're making movies. You know, the, the strip clubs and the bars can stay open because that's essential for people's well-being. That was the logic that they were purveying out of Washington and in California and elsewhere, right? And the church kind of like, okay, you know, that's stupid, okay? So the deal is, is that get back, all of us, including me, get back in alignment. God's calling us to be the salt of the earth. Righteousness and purity and doing the right thing. Impact the world. Impact the world. And we're going to be the salt of the earth. But if it's lost its taste, how can that saltiness be restored? Jesus said it's no longer good for anything to be thrown out. And so the deal is, all of us have opportunities for do better, me included. You know, and I don't want this to sound like some kind of bummer thing. You know, I, I really don't. I think that this is the kind of thing that we need to remember. God loves us just as we are, but God challenges us to act and live at a level that is so far above the world system that a lot of people think it's impossible to live that way. But I promise you, we can live that way because God operates in us. The Holy Spirit operates in us. And if we allow Holy Spirit and God to operate in us, we can live at that level. The things that Jesus called us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, the issues, they seem so, so much up here. But we can operate that way, each one of us, because God loves us. God is in us. Anyway, so, so what do we do with that? You can bring stuff here for Abba. You can bring money for Abba. You can volunteer at Abba, Visto, or any of these other things. There's a bunch of other ministries you can do to impact the world around us. You know, a bunch of things. But... You can also get engaged with the political system. Show up to the, uh, let's see, county commissioner's court. Oh, gosh. You think that it might change somebody's attitudes, you know, at the commissioner's court if all of a sudden there's a bunch of people that are just sitting there politely, right? You want to impact the world? Write a polite letter to your senator or congressman, right? That is succinct and to the point, in short. If you write a four-page letter, ain't nobody going to read it. Okay, they're going to look at it and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. The staffers are going to be like, yeah, it's another one of them nuts. And they're not going to give it to the senator to read because the senator doesn't have time for that. Okay? you got to make it short and to the point and have something to say. And you got to base it on something. Not just, hey, I think you're all doofed up. That doesn't do anybody any good. You say, this is the policy that I'm concerned about, and this is what I would like you to support as a constituent and voter. I want you to support this policy, not the agenda of the bureaucrats who are trying to corrupt this world. See what I'm saying? You know, you've got to have something in there in that communication that makes sense for godliness. If we're believers, then we need to live and act like we're believers because Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. Okay? And so all of that said, that's where we're at. So let's stand. We're going to close out. This time is moving on, and we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord God. I thank you for your grace. I pray that you touch each one of us, just like we pray that Holy Spirit moves in each one of our hearts. And every Sunday, in fact, just about every day, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you get your message out through me that individuals need to hear. It's not what I say, but it's what you want to communicate and spread into each person for the individual things that each person needs to get out and hear your words to each of us. We each have things that we can do, Lord Jesus. We have the opportunities to change our world. We have the opportunity to impact our world and be salt. We're salt. You see it, it says valuable. 
ounce for ounce worth gold and everything precious. But more importantly, you love us so much and you see us as so valuable that you died for us. And that Holy Spirit, you've come to dwell in us and to enable us to conform to the image of Jesus, to become more like Jesus. I thank you for that, Lord God. I thank you for Jesus, for all you've done in each of our lives, and that you reveal to us exactly what you want each of us to do that brings glory to your name. And we're going to close with this prayer out of the Word of God. I pray that each of us may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And so I thank you, Lord God, for that, for your, your word, that can indwell us and change us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for changing each one of us and giving us direction and guidance on what to do and how to do it. I thank you for giving people positive outlooks, and I thank you for all you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, amen.